Vaccines are said by some to be the answer to the COVID-19 pandemic, yet some Nebraskans are still hesitant to get a shot. Why is that? And why should we trust the vaccines? And how are medical experts working to address hesitancy about the vaccines now that everyone in Nebraska is eligible to get one? Tonight, we address all of that next on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Tonight we're going to be joined by a panel of medical experts and we'll be talking about vaccine hesitancy. We're also going to take a special look at communities of color who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. At first during the pandemic, polls showed minority communities to be more hesitant about the vaccine. Now that may not be as much of an obstacle for that particular community. William Padmore of NET News explores how vaccine hesitancy, though, is still a roadblock for some people of color in the state. Leo Yankton is a member of the Lakota tribe and has lived in Lincoln off and on for the past 25 years. He says that for him, not getting a vaccination was never an option. He's been fighting cancer for the past three and a half years. I felt like with all the struggles I've made through this fight against cancer, um, for me to end up dying from catching a virus would be uh, would be very counterproductive to all the suffering and work I've done, you know, to survive up to this point. While he is now fully vaccinated and not suffering any major side effects, Yankton admits he was hesitant to get the vaccine. Part of his concern was that he didn't know how he would react to the vaccine, but he points to the United States checkered medical history with communities of color as the main source of his skepticism for him and many of his fellow Native Americans. You know, we, we have historically had issues of misconduct um, and experiments on people of color in America. Um, you know, misconduct from uh, smallpox blankets, uh, from experiments that actually directly involve CDC, like the Tuskegee experiment with the syphilis in black men, um, to things even more um, recent, like the uh, sterilization of of migrants through ICE just in the last few months. As the state works to vaccinate the population, community leaders are finding concerns like these, a complex challenge in combating vaccine hesitancy. With the CDC reporting that people of color are more likely to be hospitalized and die from COVID-19, their mission takes on a grim significance. But many leaders have found distrust toward the medical community can be hard to shake. So really what I'm just trying to say is, okay, here's where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I'll give you the information. I'm glad you're questioning it. I'm glad I don't, I don't want to expect you to say, okay, well, I'll get this just because it's there. No, what questions do you have? Grand Island resident Carlos Barcenas describes himself as a speaker, facilitator, and culture broker for Hispanic communities in the state, operating through his company, I Choose Purple. He's been trying to persuade holdouts in the Hispanic community to get vaccinated, but he says he's encountered some of the same concerns Yangden mentioned. A lot of it is what you hear also on the main uh, media about just the he being hesitant because of they don't know what's in it or they've heard, you know, you might have really bad side effects um, or previous history, especially in the history with people of color. There's this, I'm hesitant to trust. Is this something that is good or something that is not? Some things have to do just with lack of information. Um, not enough information to people to make a decision. By recounting his own vaccination, Barcenas hopes to convince vaccine holdouts to reconsider or at least seek out a medical professional with more information. Thanks. Reverend Ralph Lassiter is senior pastor at Mount Moriah Baptist Church in Omaha and says he's been using his platform as a preacher to promote vaccinations in black communities. But recently, he's been running into trouble convincing younger people. I have to acknowledge that some people have concerns. I have to acknowledge that sometimes individuals don't believe that maybe it's going to affect them. 
And so uh, my response is to ask them, do you have a loved one? Do you have a parent? Do you have a grandparent? Uh, do you have someone who uh, is older, who maybe has an underlying health condition, maybe they're diabetic, maybe uh, they uh, have some extra pounds, uh, have had some cardiovascular issues, because even though you may believe that you won't have the severe impact on your health relative to uh, having contracted the COVID-19 virus, you could still carry it. And if you carry it and you carry it home, you carry it to uh, your grandparents' home, then they can be much more severely impacted. With the CDC calling for a pause in the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine due to concerns over the rare development of blood clots after use, efforts to convince those on the fence may have gotten even tougher. Department of Health and Human Services CEO Danette Smith says the state has been trying to tackle hesitancy with their Finish Strong initiative where we are talking with everybody, particularly those persons of color, uh, about what it means to be vaccinated, why you need to be vaccinated, where you can go and get vaccinated. And we have some wonderful partners throughout the state of Nebraska, particularly in our Douglas, Lincoln, uh, Lincoln, Lancaster area, who have been partnering with us on town hall meetings, uh, Zoom meetings to just get the word out there. Still, Smith has her work cut out for her. While his faith seems to have been rewarded for now, Leo Yankton in Lincoln says his feelings about the health industry remain complex. I still feel this distrust where I don't feel like I should be pushing the vaccine, but um, by showing through example that uh, I was willing to take this and willing to take this leap of faith, uh, you know, it will convince some people to actually take the vaccine. For Speaking of Nebraska, I'm William Padmore. It's our panel of medical experts that we have with us tonight to discuss vaccine hesitancy on Speaking of Nebraska. We begin with Dr. Afua Ntem Minsa, who is an infectious disease physician at Faith Regional Health Services in Norfolk. Dr. Uh, Josue Gutierrez, a family physician at Saline Medical Specialties, welcome. Also, Dr. Kiana King, assistant professor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center's Center for Reducing Health Disparities. And Dr. Bob Rahner, the president of Partnership for a Healthy Lincoln. And I do want to take just a minute by way of full disclosure to say that NET has received production support for this episode of Speaking Nebraska from the Centers for Disease Control through the Partnership for a Healthy Lincoln, but neither Dr. Rahner nor his staff has determined editorial content for this program. All right, we are ready to get underway. We're going to be talking to our panelists. We've also solicited, solicited questions from social media throughout the week from our followers, and we also have encouraged our audience here at Lincoln High to ask questions, and we'll do our best to get those answered as well. We're going to start off with just a little bit of a background, some of the facts. As many of you know, in the United States, there are three COVID-19 vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. Pfizer is 95% effective in preventing severe cases. It takes two doses. Moderna is 94% effective. It has two doses as well. And Johnson & Johnson, which is just one dose, is 66% effective. Johnson & Johnson has been restarted in Nebraska after, uh, and across the nation after being paused due to a rare and severe type of blood clot clotting detected in just a few women. So uh, our medical experts, uh, I want to uh, assume, I guess, at this point that I think you're all recommending that people should get one of these vaccines. Dr. Mensah, let's start with you. You're an infectious disease expert. From your perspective, how effective are the vaccines in the effort to end this pandemic? I think the vaccines are really effective. And I'll tell you that since we started vaccinating in Northeast Nebraska, the people who have all been admitted in the hospital are not vaccinated. So I tell people that the vaccine, the, the infection is pretty much set, uh, singling out people who are not vaccinated. And you have people from all ages, right down from 20 years of age up to 80 years of age who are not vaccinated being admitted in the hospital. But people who are vaccinated 
are not being admitted in the hospital for COVID-19 at this time. Dr. Gutierrez, if we look at the numbers in Nebraska, about 42% of people of the eligible population are fully vaccinated. About 56% of the eligible population are partially vaccinated. But if you look at the seven-day average, we're down about 38% with vaccinations over the last two weeks. You were someone who, from the very beginning of this pandemic, uh, were, you were uh, on top of precautions like masks, social distancing, and washing hands. So knowing that we've got this far into the pandemic and now we've got these vaccinations, does it concern you that that trend is a little bit downward right now? Yes, it's concerning because um, we are getting there. I think that it's very important for us to truly continue to fight against this virus. It's extremely important for us not to give up right now. I think there's a lot of people out there saying things about the vaccine, maybe a lot of misinformation that's being uh, set out there for a lot of people. And I think that is not the right thing to do. I think we have a lot of medical experts that have been vaccinated. So mm -hmm. if they have been vaccinated, they know their science. They trust these vaccines. So I think we need to trust the medical experts now and continue on the road to, to be better and to actually get to some sense of normalcy after COVID. Dr. King, you've spent time focusing on vaccine hesitancy among minority communities. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And, of course, they've been more impacted by COVID-19 in general. They've not been vaccinated at the rates that they make up in the population. So, uh, Dr. King, as someone who studies health disparities, why do you think people of color have been more impacted uh, by COVID-19? And how important are these vaccines to those communities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I believe that minority communities, um, people of color, have been more um, affected by COVID uh, for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, vaccine hesitancy um, has been an issue, but I don't think that's the only issue. Spe specifically in uh, communities of color, there's also access issues uh, that have not been fully addressed. Uh, there's not equitable access to vaccines. So I think we need to make sure that we're not forgetting about these other issues that go along with vaccine hesitancy. And Dr. Uh, Ronner, you've spent much of your career working with rural and underserved communities. So what would you have to add about the impact of both COVID and uh, vaccinations for people of color? Well, part of the problem, of course, is when they were affected more likely because of the jobs they occupied, sometimes lack of communication, and sometimes the living environment. If you're in a three-generation household, it's hard to, hard to isolate, or if you're in a big ranch with just two people. And so a lot of things put them at higher risk. Now our problem is I think there was a lack of messaging initially. We're catching up, and I think that's why that, the differences in hesitancy are, are, are coming down, not because there's anything inherent. It was a lack of appropriate communication. Uh, now it's an access issue that, you know, some, uh, unfortunately it was sort of baked in that we'd have some disparity because if we, if we do for immunize people in nursing homes and health professionals, they're m more majority white, so you're going to catch up. So now it's an access issue. And last is a trust issue. Where do people want to get vaccinated? They most want to get vaccinated at their doctor's office by the doctor and nurse that they know. So we now need to move from the mass vaccinations to the, to the multiple site vaccinations where they can go to like Dr. Gutierrez's clinic and go to his clinic and get vaccinated because they know him and they trust him and also get some vaccination clinics into the communities themselves, smaller types of clinics? Yes. yes. Dr. Minsaw, several polls in the last few months have indicated about one in four in Americans say they don't want a vaccine. So if herd immunity is the goal to control the pandemic, is that possible if a fourth of Americans don't get the shot? That's a great question. Um, I was actually asked about herd immunity in my local hospital a couple of days ago. Um, I think at this point in time, we should probably talk about more people getting vaccinated rather than talking about herd immunity, because we also have the issues of uh, vaccine variants. Uh, we have the issue of COVID-19 variants all around us, and um, with COVID-19 variants, herd immunity becomes a moving target. At this point, um, I think the information that we should probably talk about is as many people get vaccinated, the number of cases of COVID-19 will cool down, the virus will stop mutating, and then we will probably be reaching towards a goal. But when a, a quarter of Americans don't want to get vaccinated, we pretty much cannot talk about herd immunity in that case. And Dr. Ronner, back to you. And 
playing off that uh, talk about variants, more than 550 cases involving COVID variants uh, have been detected in Nebraska. So do the variants or now or will they eventually impact the effectiveness of the vaccine? Probably. I think that the jury's still out a little bit on that. It looks like the vaccines we have are mostly effective, but we're going to have more mutants. And so these may not be the last. Uh, the other challenge we're running into is the people who are infected with the original strain, they may not be immune to the second strain. There's data coming out now that six months later, people are getting reinfected. They thought that this was a one and done thing. They thought it was like measles. Once you get measles, you're usually good for life unless you're immunocompromised for some reason. It's looking like coronavirus is not like that. It's more like pertussis or tetanus where you have to get boosters on a regular basis. So it's likely, I think, that there will be a booster. We don't know for sure, but I think it's probably likely that, you know, this fall or winter we may end up with a third shot if you've already had Pfizer or Moderna, for example. Let's talk more specifically about some of these communities of color, and let's begin with the black community in Nebraska now. They make up just over 5% of the state's population. Currently, they make up only less than 3% of the state's population that is fully vaccinated. So they're not getting vaccinated at the rate that they should be. Uh, Dr. King, we've heard in the past about mistrust of the medical community. We've also heard about access to the vaccine. Are those two of the main reasons why we're seeing the black community not get vaccinated at the, at the rate they should be? I do believe that those are two of the primary reasons why vaccination isn't happening um, at, a, at a faster pace. Um, I think the mistrust is thick and runs uh, deep in our community as well as historically in this country. Uh, so being able to overcome that is really going to take um, exposure to medical professionals that look like the black community, so that are black, um, whether that be community health workers, doctors, nurses, those are uh, the, the staff that need to be delivering the message about COVID vaccine and the importance of COVID vaccine uh, to the black community because that's where the trust lies within. It, it, there's, there's a lack of trust in that healthcare system. Um, and so if, if somebody looks like, um, uh, if somebody is a part of that community, then they're going to be more likely to get vaccinated. As far as the access piece, um, that has, been uh, an issue, I think, historically for our healthcare system, um, for uh, communities of color, particularly the black community. Um, and so just making sure that there's access to uh, different clinics within the communities, I think uh, Dr. Ronner mentioned, uh, making sure that we get those smaller community clinics uh, available within the, the community. Um, I think in Omaha, specifically Douglas County, the, the black population is about 11%, so a little bit bigger, obviously, uh, than the state overall population. But the point of that is that in, in Omaha, we really have tried to make sure that there's smaller clinics within the uh, areas where a majority of black and brown people are um, residing and just really making that community effort. So a lot of the community organizations are partnering with Douglas County Health Department um, and really trying to make that work and, and get black people as well as brown people vaccinated. Dr. Gutierrez, uh, NPR recently reported, uh, they went out and asked people of color about why they weren't getting the vaccine. And a couple of things that came up in, the, in those questions, they cited health inequities and they cited medical racism, the possibility that black people uh, have that disparity in health coverage, potential biases also held by healthcare workers against people of color in their care. Has that ever come up? Do you think that's uh, this, the case in Nebraska? Are those two reasons that are legitimate? I think at this time you have to I have to take the example of my clinic. My clinic is um, a lot of Hispanic population come to me just because I speak Spanish. Uh, I live in in Crete, and a lot of the the population in Crete is Hispanic. We we have around six percent of the of the school system is Hispanic there. So I think whenever you talk about access, whenever you talk about feeling comfortable with that clinician, if you go to a clinician that speaks your language, that has gone the vaccine, and tells you, hey, it's safe, I'm still here. I think that's some, some very important. Now, if we talk about racism and uh, in the medical community, I think, yes, it's probably out there. And yes, it has happened a lot uh, in the history. Uh, I'm not sure how prevalent it is in, in Nebraska, but at least we need to differentiate that from, is it an issue of people not being comfortable in that medical setting versus how true racism is in that, in that facility? And that's a, kind of be like an internal investigation or internal um, something that they, that community has to do internally to see if that's the case. 
Yeah. We're talking about vaccine hesit hesitancy and skepticism on this special edition of Speaking of Nebraska. I want to remind you that uh, our panel includes uh, Dr. Afua N. Tim Mansaw, uh, Dr. Kiana King, Dr. Jose Gutierrez, and Dr. Bob Rahner. I'm Dennis Kellogg, your moderator for this. We talked about access, and before we leave this particular topic, uh, Dr. King will talk about Omaha, which is where you're based, and it's home to Nebraska's largest minority populations. Omaha currently has six vaccination sites, one downtown, one southwest, one west, one south, two in North Omaha, and uh, as many know, the large minority populations seem to be located in North and South Omaha. So are we doing enough to get reach out to these minority communities, bring the vaccine to where they are, and are there other things like, for instance, as we saw in our opening piece, reaching out to black community leaders like pastors of black churches? Should we be doing more of that uh, to get the uh, facts out about vaccinations? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in Douglas County, we were a little slow, in my opinion, to get um, into the black and brown communities in Omaha, but um, we are there now, and I think with the community organizations um, really pushing uh, to, to get these vac uh, vaccine clinics set up in North and South Omaha has been really helpful, especially in this last, I wanna say four to five weeks. Um, there's been a real big push there. So I think that's happening. Uh, as far as getting pastors involved, absolutely. I think getting the faith-based community involved, anyone that in the black community who holds um, a position of leadership that, uh, that is looked up to is going to be really critical and key in getting more um, black people vaccinated in North Omaha or in Omaha uh, in general. Um, I think uh, people that look like, like me as well help to um, answer the questions to um, soothe any fears or just kind of the misinformation or what we call um, in public health the infodemic that's happening where there's this um, inaccurate, inaccurate information that's, that's given out um, that really causes more uh, problems with the people being vaccine hesitant or um, as uh, Dr. Giselle Corby Smith has mentioned, uh, vaccine deliberation where they're trying to weigh those pros and cons. When you have that misinformation, it really does uh, keep people vaccine hesitant or um, against getting the vaccine. So really trying to uh, uh, fight against that, that misinformation is really gonna be critical in, in utilizing and leveraging um, community leaders such as pastors, uh, black physicians, black nurses, et cetera, to really help push that message and get more people vaccinated. Let's talk also specifically about the Hispanic community. Hispanics make up more than 11% of the population, and currently they're just under 5% of the eligible population that's fully vaccinated. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez, are there reasons specific to the H Hispanic community regarding vaccine hesitancy, or is it more of the same about what we've been talking about throughout the program? I think at this time also you have to take the language into account. I think a lot of the resources initially were mostly given out in English. And if you l go to some of the websites, it is much better now, but initially it was a very complex system in a different language. So that essentially is a barrier to the Hispanic community at times. So they then go to, uh, normally it's, uh, it's the leader in the community that knows English and ask them about, hey, can you help me get into this website and, and uh, you know, log on? Or can you help me call the health department because they're afraid of calling the health department if they only speak Spanish. They don't know if that health department has that language for, available for them. So that's whenever that community leader, that, that um, person that knows English, that instantly becomes that leader for that community, it's extremely important to get, in your, get, get knowledge to them saying, hey, the vaccine is safe. Because if that community leader tells them it's not safe, they will listen to him or her. So you have to be, be aware of, of that. That's how it works sometimes in the Hispanic community. So that's a, that's a little caveat that maybe not other minorities have because of the language barrier. And it's not only Spanish. There's a lot of other um, minorities as well in Nebraska that have that language barrier. And I think we are getting there, but I think we need more resources to push that, that through. Um, I think in the video, that gentleman from Grand Island is doing an excellent job trying to you know, target the Hispanic community, trying to let them know, hey, this is out there, these are resources, this is information in Spanish for you guys. That's gonna be the way we can really help push this through. 
Dr. Ronner, when it comes to uh, undocumented immigrants in the vaccine, the health department say that they're not going to ask about citizenship. But uh, are you seeing the undocumented immigrants being hesitant about getting the vaccine at all because of their current status? I think so, partly because right now you have to get on a government website and people don't want to put their data on a government website. And so by going to the clinic that takes care of me, I don't have to go through that initial step. And that's, again, one reason why it needs to be in the clinics, because they already have a trusted relationship. Uh, so for example, we're working on, you know, like part of a message, it's how do you say it, who, what you say, how you say it, who says it. Mm -hmm. Well, here in Lincoln, a Hispanic uh, family, they might want to hear it from Horacio Alvarez Ramirez, who is a family physician, native Spanish speaker at Blue Stem, who is their doctor. Couldn't be a better messenger to that community than him and they can go to his clinic and get it where they absolutely trust him. And so they don't have to go putting their data into a government website because there's some issues there. Uh, and so I think that's a combination of, of who, what, who says it. Uh, you know, I may know what, what their data is. I may know how to say it, but only say it in English, unfortunately. So you want host way if you're going to say it in Spanish. And they might trust him or they might trust Dr. King more than me. And so that's why that other, and we're also in Lincoln, the same thing. The black clergy in Lincoln are actually uniting right now and they're working on carrying the message to their, to their congregations who better to carry the message than them. Dr. Mensah, what about other populations? Lincoln's home to the largest Yazidi population outside of Iraq. North Omaha is becoming increasingly populated by the Korean immigrants from Myanmar or Burma. Likely there's a language barrier there too. So are those communities likely to trust the information that they're given? I think as my other colleagues have said, you have to use the leaders in all these, com in all these communities you have to work through the leaders. People trust people who look like them. They trust people who speak the language that they speak. It's easier to communicate with people when they see someone who looks like them. And there's always this cultural barrier. There's always this little amount of mistrust. Sadly enough, you know, you have people coming from all over um, the world and they tend to trust their own rather than trusting someone who does not look like them. So you have to go through the community leaders. If it's going to go through the major mosque that they all go through, you go through the leaders in a mosque. If it's going to go through a faith, another faith leader, you go through the faith leader. If you realize that there's a teacher who teaches in one of the schools that is from that community, you go through that teacher because that's how you're going to get the community to get fascinated. And you try to translate their, their language. You try to translate from English into their language because you want them to understand, you want them to get vaccinated. And once the community leader, leader is vaccinated, they will all follow. People follow people they trust. Mm -hmm. And I think that would probably get more people vaccinated. I also want to touch on Native Americans because the Native American tribes have been seen as leading the way on coronavirus vaccinations nationwide. In some cases, fully vaccinated rates for Native Americans are running 10% higher than that of the U.S. population. So I'll open this up to anybody who wants to weigh in on it, but what is happening with the Native American tribes and what lessons are we learning from what they're doing? I think they've also been one of the hardest hit populations. Right. So I think they've also seen how bad this can be. They've seen examples in each household or they have friends, family, really truly suffer, young, old, doesn't matter. This, this virus has no, no race, no age, nothing. This, this hits anyone. So I think after seeing that much you know, devastation, those community leaders said, hey, we love our communities. Let's go ahead and push this through. I think it's, it's all community there. And also the allocation went through the Indian service mm -hmm. and they have leaders. You, you have um, Native American leaders who are physicians who speak for their community. So they were right on, they spoke to their community and they started vaccinating all age groups really early. Right from the 90 year old to the 16 year old, you had Native Americans being vaccinated. And he's right, they were really hit hard my hospital happens to be um, the regional hospital in northeast Nebraska, and we happen to have Native American people coming all the way from areas where they didn't have access to any big hospital to be hospitalized in um, Faith Regional, and we had that problem. So they were really hit hard with COVID. They saw COVID um, kill people. Um, they saw COVID um, kill people. It, it, and, COVID is kind of irrespective of race. So one thing that we have to mm -hmm. talk about is that, you know, when you, you talk about COVID, you see COVID 
um, kind of the mortality amongst the Caucasians is really among people who are older. But when you go to other minorities, when you go into the African-American population, you go into the Hispanic population, you go into the African-American, the native Alaskan population, COVID was killing people who are much younger, mm -hmm. people in their 20s, people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and that's such a huge disparity. And that's why we have to get to the minorities to get vaccinated. So we spent a lot of time in this program so far talking about communities of colors and we'll con uh, communities of color, and we'll continue to do that. But from a mid to late March survey conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation, the highest rates of certain U.S. demographics not willing to take a vaccine are actually rural residents, white evangelical Christians, and Republicans. They poll between 20 and 29 percent as saying they won't take a vaccine. Now, at one point, black adults would have been higher. In December, that same poll reported 49% of black residents didn't want to get the vaccine. That's now changed. The latest numbers from March polling show 10% of black Americans don't want the vaccine. But are we seeing or should we see a shift in messaging away from the communities of color to target some of these other demographic groups that are showing to be more hesitant to the vaccine? Dr. King, I'll ask that of you. Absolutely not. I think um, we still need to have messaging go to the communities of color just the same. Um, I, I think the other uh, populations that you mentioned, yes, there needs to be messaging there as well. So, I mean, the, the messaging needs to be strong across the board. It's not we should ease up on one community or one population and focus on another. I think that's been the issue and the problem in the United States is that we tend to focus on the wrong communities at the wrong times when we should be focusing or trying to find a way to be equitable about how that message is spread um, and making sure that everybody has an opportunity, everybody um, has access, and that we are making sure that people are getting vaccinated. We really need to get these vaccines in arms. And so, no, I don't think that we should try to shift our focus in terms of the messaging. But Dr. King, let me follow up on that. Does that mean the messaging is working with communities of color because we're seeing some improvement? Um, I can't say that that's necessarily the, the case. Um, I can say that with the um, involvement of leaders, of uh, people of color that are in health professions careers, and um, just opening up the access and, 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 sh and letting people know the importance of getting the vaccine has also been instrumental in making sure that those numbers uh, or the rates have gone down in terms of uh, vaccine hesitancy, but the number of uh, folks being vaccinated has gone up. So no, I, I think um, it's a combination. It's not just the messaging. And before we leave this particular line of questioning, Dr. Ronner, I do want to bring you in on it and ask you, you know, when we're talking about rural residents, we're talking about 35 percent at, at when one poll saying they don't want to get the vaccine. They think the problems are exaggerated by the media. Uh, matter of fact, NPR reported in April in Nebraska, rural counties, about nine percentage points difference between rural and urban counties in the vaccinations. So. How do you reach the rural communi communities with uh, facts about vaccinations? I actually think some of the same problems are at play. It's, again, who's carrying the message? Uh, I grew up in western Nebraska. I grew up in Sydney. I worked on the farm growing up. And, you know, western Nebraska doesn't trust the government. It just is what it is. So the government is the wrong place to carry the message. So it needs to be not a governmental messenger. Uh, it needs to be local people. It needs to be their local doctor, their local nurse, their local hospital administrator, their local evangelical clergy. Just like we're working with the black clergy in Lincoln, we should be working with the evangelicals. We should be working with them, and they should carry the message. Uh, because again, yeah, there's a lot of distrust out there. It's a very libertarian, leave me alone mentality. I understand it. Uh, I grew up that way. So just like I'm not the best messenger to maybe the, the Guatemalan community, Postway is probably not the best messenger to the white farm kid from Western Nebraska either. And so I think, again, it's a messenger problem. So let's get into some of the common concerns that we're hearing about from people who are vaccine hesitant. Um, Josue, uh, let's start with you. Uh, let's talk about one of the ones that we sometimes hear, that vaccines will cause side effects and they will be worse than actually getting COVID itself. That is not true. <laughs> um, we have seen people die from this virus, so it cannot be worse than, than this virus. I think a lot of the common um, side effects are just like the flu shot at times. Uh, you, you have a wide range of things that can happen after, after the shot, but we are seeing that within 48 hours, you are okay. I think it's a lot of, uh, forgive the, the word, fear-mongering, 
uh, from media. T at times, they get information from their friends saying, hey, I just felt bad. I had some fever. Oh, it's, it's bad, man. It's bad. But they don't know the true, uh, true fear or true virus, what that can cause. Mm -hmm. So I think that they really, it's, it's a perspective issue. If you've been on the front lines and seen what this virus can cause, you would have no doubt in getting that shot in your arms. Dr. Mensah, I want to ask you this question. It comes from uh, a, a, one of our viewers over email. He's saying the vaccine was developed too fast. Does this mean it's unsafe? And uh, another viewer writes in, why are we using a test that is not approved? It's authorized, not approved. How would you answer those questions? So to the first question about it being developed too fast, I'll start by saying that the technology was developed more than 20 years ago. The technology was basically developed for other conditions. Number one was cancer. It's already there. It's already been used in other viruses and was never used in large scale for those viruses because those viruses never ended up causing a pandemic. It's safe. It's been tried and tested multiple times. However, in 2019, we had COVID and they had the opportunity to use the technology for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's safe, it might be safer than some of the vaccines we have out there, because we have a lot of information being released to the media, people are kind of, they, they have a bit of information overload. Nobody asks what goes into the, into the cancer medications. Nobody asks what goes into other medications that you take for high blood pressure, for diabetes, what the side effects are. Nobody takes the side, asks the side effects for oral contraceptive pills. Everything has side effects. The vaccines are safe, they work well, the technology has been present for a while. The only thing that happened was that people worked fast because we knew that this is a pandemic. This is a pandemic that's killing populations. We need to get to a point where we can start saving lives. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Everyone who has received the vaccination will not say anything else. There are no microchips being put in, into people's arms. We've all been vaccinated and we are all doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Nobody has grown a third eye. It's safe. It does not affect women from having babies. People have been vaccinated in the clinical trials. People were vaccinated and still got pregnant. I know of a lot of people who have been vaccinated and still got pregnant after they got their vaccination you won't have side effects that will affect you in the long term. Dr. King, a similar question that actually goes down a different road. PJ writes to us via email, the COVID vaccine, he's saying, is not FDA approved. There has been no vaccine developed and administered this quickly. There have been no vaccines of this kind using messenger RNA. So his question is, why shouldn't I wait four to six years to see what the long-term effects are since I have no comorbidities. The question is why they shouldn't wait? Why shouldn't I wait four to six years and see how this plays out? Because I'm, I'm not at risk. I don't have those, <laughs> those risks. So you can still um, be at risk even if you aren't, don't have a comorbidity with, for COVID. So um, I just, again, I think it is um, not understanding the vaccine, not understanding uh, the information that is available um, for people to to read, uh, to, to really make an uh, informed decision about getting vaccinated. Um, the vaccine is and has been approved, so I'm not sure where that is coming from, um, as there's plenty of information that's available for that. But that goes back to what I was saying earlier that um, you can have this information available at your fingertips, but if you're not understanding how to interpret that information, it, it starts to become challenging and you just start to make up what you feel you're, you're reading or what you believe you're reading. And so having um, people that are well-versed in the, um, the procedures, that the clinical trial procedures that's done to uh, create the vaccine, um, making sure they understand what it means to have mRNA that's used versus uh, um, something, uh, DNA, it's, it's different. So um, having trusted sources that can walk them through that information 
answer those questions is going to be really important for people like PJ so that they are not um, making assumptions that one, it's not approved, two, they don't have comorbidities, so they're okay. We still don't understand the long-term effects of COVID. Um, and there are some uh, research that's out that's saying that it could affect your heart muscle. There's certain things that could happen long-term that we aren't sure. So not getting vaccinated is putting yourself at risk for the long-term effects of COVID, not just necessarily the long-term effects of the vaccine. I want to remind you, you're watching Speaking of Nebraska. We're talking about vaccine hesitancy uh, tonight. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg, and our panel, Dr. Afua Ntem Minsa, Dr. Kiana King, Dr. Jose Gutierrez, and Dr. Bob Ronner. And Dr. Ronner, I uh, want to ask you the next question that comes from Susan of, over Facebook. She says, can you talk about the natural immunity of those who have had COVID? She says she just keeps hearing, get the shot anyway, just because. Well, the, the assumption, some people started with the assumption that if I got it, I was done like measles. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we didn't know that, and now we've proven that that's actually not correct, that people are getting reinfected anywhere from three to nine months later. Well, you don't know that until three to nine months have actually passed. You, you can't predict the future. You have to wait for it to happen. And that's what's happened. We're already now seeing people getting uh, reinfected. So just last week, a study published in a Kentucky nursing home, they had a, a, an outbreak. Uh, and a bunch of people got infected, they got under control, and then months later they had another outbreak. Twelve of those people who'd already been infected got infected again, one of whom died. And it wasn't that long, and so we know that the older you are, the more likely you are to get reinfected. And of course what we're seeing in Brazil, Brazil thought they got the herd immunity the natural way, now that they're finding they haven't. Uh, and one thing I want to talk about just briefly is the, the idea that the vaccine got rushed into production. What, what, it, the same amount of studies were actually done as any other, other vaccine, it's just they did them all in the same year. Usually you do phase one, then they stop, they have meetings, they have investor calls, they think about it, they plan, they wait six months, a year, then they do phase two, then they, there's a lot of financial risk there. And so the, one of the brilliant things the Trump administration did with Warp Speed is they told the vaccine manufacturers, we'll take the financial risk out, so you don't have to have those six months of investor calls and raising money, just do them all and we'll pay for it. So the same number of studies got done, they just got done all in one year instead of spread out over a decade, and so that's how it happened faster. The other thing, it's... I think it's valid for people who've been hesitant initially. When there was only 30,000 studies, I know a vaccine person who said, I don't get comfortable until 3 million doses have been given. So when it first came out and only 30,000 people got it, it, it was natural for some to be hesitant, and some went first, some didn't. But we passed 3 million, we passed 30 million, we're well over 100 million. This isn't new anymore, and we've got data on all of it. So. Dr. Gutierrez, I want to ask you a question from Tammy. She wrote in via email and says, do we have to get another two shots in a year from our last one, or is it sooner? Or will they have one shot by that time? And also, will we still have to get the flu shot two every year, or will they combine them into one shot? Wow. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, I'm guessing a pharmaceutical company is like, whoa, wait a second. No, but I think we don't know. The, the answer right now is we don't know. I think Moderna is, doing, is uh, having some studies right now of a possible booster shot. Mm -hmm after six, nine months. So the, the, the short answer is we still don't know. This might become a seasonal issue. This might beca become something like the flu shot. But at this time, we still don't know. I, I'm not sure if you want to kind of tag into that and, and a little bit more of studies. I think you're right. We still don't know. Um, and with the variants, I think in terms of the boosters, the boosters are being made to target the, the variants. We don't know how many more variants we'll have, uh, maybe nine months from now, 12 months from now. I think every country right now has its own variant of COVID. Mm -hmm. You see countries battling COVID right now. You know India is battling their own COVID. Brazil has its own variant of COVID. And South Africa has its own variant of COVID. We had um, the COVID variant from the UK. And you'd be surprised. And even states in the United States um, have their own variants of of COVID. We have the California variant, we have the New York variant. So we still don't know. Um, I think at this point in time, you need to get vaccinated with what we have. And what I try to tell people who happen to walk into my consulting room is that when you get vaccinated with what we have now, you're going to have some level of protection. It's going to keep you out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. We need to send that message across to people that you get vaccinated now, it's going to keep you out of the hospital. We don't have a lot of cases of variants in Nebraska, so this is a time for a lot of people to get vaccinated. 
We need to get more people vaccinated and, how, uh, and have our virus numbers really, really low. And who knows, maybe the variants may pass over us, but at this point in time, more people, we need to get more shots into arms. And the question about I don't have any comorbidities. We saw people without any comorbidities admitted to the hospital die from COVID. Mm -hmm. We've seen people admitted to the hospital spend months in the hospital, intubated in the hospital because of COVID. I tell my patients, I tell the general public, you don't know how your body will react to COVID. That's just the truth. Mm -hmm. You could be the healthiest person on earth. You could run marathons. You just don't know how your body is going to react. It's better to be vaccinated than to get COVID. So following up on that, we got another question that was sent to us via email. Uh, she says that she's a black 66-year-old female. She has a host of medical issues, heart failure, lupus, thyroid disease. She had a gastric bypass surgery and knee replacements as well. She says, I've got major concerns about taking the vaccine. Should she have those concerns, Dr. Ronner? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I guess a lot of things, it's a risk versus a benefit. It's a safe vaccine, it's not, but the risk isn't zero but we can quantify that risk. Like the Johnson Johnson stuff that just came out, yes, it can cause a blood clot, but it's seven out of a million if you're a woman of childbearing age. If you're a, a man, it's less than one of them in a million. So is there a risk? Yes, it's bad if it happens, but there's the risk of that one in a million, and then there's maybe the one in a thousand chance that you're gonna die. It's a thousand-fold difference. So if you're a betting man, you're gonna want the vaccine, not, not, not try to risk this, because it's just not even close. And so people, may, I think partly it's that understanding how to quantify that risk. Yes, there's a risk, but the benefit is so outweighing it. And, and for this woman, it, I mean, her chances yeah. of dying if she gets coronavirus might be as high as one in 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting question comes to us on Facebook from John, and he says, quite simply, what's in the vaccine? Does anybody want to take it? So it's basically the mRNA. Um, so it depends on the vaccine. So for the... Moderna and the Pfizer vaccination is basically mRNA, which is uh, suspended in a nano lipid particle. So lipid particle, you can equate it to something like oil or cholesterol. So that's basically what it is. Um, then you have um, a few components to keep it safe um, and keep it to be able to store it so that we can deliver it from the storage into people's arms. And I'll just say something. What's basically in these vaccines are the same things that are found in other vaccines. Um, what you find in the flu shot, some of the components of the mRNA vaccines are found in flu shots. What you find in the AstraZeneca or you find in the, um, you find in the Johnson & Johnson, they, these same components are found in other vaccines also. I, I actually decided to go through all vaccines that we have in the United States, and all these components, they are just about the same. These are the same things they use to manufacture vaccines. Uh, nobody ever asks about what you find in vaccines. You know, you, you have mothers leading their children to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician gives a child vaccination, and that's the end of it. But right now with COVID, you know, people are asking, these are the things that you've been receiving all these years. These are the things you had when you were a baby and you're still alive and you grew up to be an old person. Dr. Gutierrez, another question that came to us via email. Why do I need a vaccine when there are therapeutics to cure it and the survival rate is 99.9%? Because you don't want to be the one that's not in the survival rate. I think at this time, we, you need to think of not only yourself, but everyone else around you. This is like we are a community. If you are a loner, if you are just in your house all day long, you have to go out sometime. You, you are exposed to things, be it that mailman, whoever it is, you have to be thinking of everyone around you. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have any comor comorbid conditions, think of your fellow man that might. If you are passing that virus along, because you might be, you, you might have no symptoms, but still have that that virus, you're still passing it to that other individual. So I think that's something you need to think about as well. There's always a possibility, even though there's a 99% whatever uh, survival rate, you have to think about that, you know, point 0.1 or actually point, it's a little bit higher than that. But just think of it that way. 
Dr. Rahner and Dr. Gutierrez, you're both uh, primary care physicians. Would it make a difference, and I think you brought this up briefly earlier, if we get these vaccinations taking place with a personal doctor, someone that they know that they can get it in their doctor's office as part of a routine checkup? Do you think that makes a difference? Yes. At this time, our local public health solutions is uh, the local public health department. They have done an excellent job. We have We've actually partnered with the, with the health department to get some of the vaccines come out of our clinic. That has increased quite a bit the availability of those patients to come into our clinic and get those vaccines from someone that always does it every single year, year after year. They know our process, they call us, they, they, everything is, is just the usual another vaccine checkup or another health maintenance checkup for them. So it's something that's known to them. It, it really eases those fears that they're around this vaccine. So that's one component of it. The other thing is, is you need to let the people have been doing it for so many years that already know how to do these things to continue to do it. I think that putting an infrastructure for health departments to do it and things like that, yes, it's important, but why reinvent the wheel if the wheel has already been running great from primary care offices? I think that's something you need to also think about. So I think as, as we move along in this pandemic and if, this, if more shots are needed, it will eventually migrate to those primary care clinics because that's where they should be. Dr. Also, King, are there, yeah. did you want to jump in, well, Dr. There's also Ron? a big issue of timing. We're now pivoting to children. Mm -hmm. So we're already approved to 16 to 18. The phase three trial is done for 12 to 15, so it's probably being out this summer. What usually happens this summer? Well, it's, it's school and physical mm -hmm. season, sports physical season. All summer long, they're gonna be seeing their family doctor and pediatrician. Who better to explain them to them, their pediatrician and family doctor right now? That There's no, no PSA or billboard can compete with me going in and bringing my child to see pediatrician Dr. Phil Boucher and Phil saying, hey, here's why I'd like you to get the vaccine. So mm -hmm. the timing right now is really important. So June, July, August, that's when the seventh grade physicals, the football physicals, the pre-participation, they're all gonna be there. Everybody's going to their doctor this summer to get those done. Why not have this be the time to start delivering those vaccines? I want to ask you, is there any reason that you can think of not to get the vaccine? I mean, we have seen healthcare workers who have not gotten the vaccine. We have seen some doctors who have come out and been against the vaccine. So is there any reason that any of you can think of that is legitimate to not get the vaccine? If you're allergic to any of the components in any of the vaccination, in any of the vaccines, you should probably not get the vaccination. I think that's the main contraindication to getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Immunocompromised people can get vaccinated. Uh, people with comorbidities can get vaccinated. If you have allergies, you are always advised to talk to your primary care provider or talk to um, your allergist before you get vaccinated. Uh, we run a vaccine clinic. We partner with our local health department and the people who have allergies come to the clinic all the time and they read to us the allergies they have and we go through with them. These, uh, there's always a small risk. However, you should get vaccinated. And if you look at the data out there, the data published by CDC, the number of people who have had allergies from getting vaccination is really, really, really minute. There's always a risk but the risk is really minimal. And all the vaccine centers I know have medications that it can give to someone if they do have a reaction in the vaccine center. We're starting to see a loosening of some of the restrictions around Nebraska. Is that a good idea? Are we doing it too soon or are we on time? I think we're doing it too soon. Uh, I think we need to continue to require masks um, and have the social distancing. I think when we, we're going through this fatigue right now and, and um, in Omaha, there are elections and politicians are interested in getting reelected. And so I think that also is a motivator for some of them to say, you know, maybe we should just hold off on this mass mandate. No, I think we need to continue to do this until um, a, a higher percentage of uh, Nebraskans are, well, people and Americans in general, but specifically in Nebraska are vaccinated before we start considering that let's make data informed decisions. Uh, in Omaha specifically, we've had a small spike from March to April. So in May, the mass mandate ends. Why would we want to end that if we are showing that there is a spike that could continue into May and potentially into the summer, especially with, uh, as my colleague mentioned, 
that sports are, are happening, um, kids are coming out of school and, and going to be there, be at home for the summer or be out for the summer. We want to make sure that we are staying safe and everybody is staying safe. Um, so no, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't let up just quite yet. Just have a couple of minutes left. So Dr. Gutierrez, I'm going to turn to you and, and ask you if you have a patient in your office and that patient is telling you, I hear what you're saying, but I still don't want to get that vaccine. Is there anything you can say to that patient to turn them around? What's the one thing you could say, you, do you think, to, to make them think differently about vaccinations? In rural areas, I think that a lot of people have seen, we have a local meatpacking plant and uh, we were hard hit, Crete was hard hit. So everyone knows someone that has you know, passed and they know the impact that has had in that small community. So I think the, the only thing I say is, you, you are, you know, you're the boss boss. I cannot force you to do anything. You can come to me with any questions you have. Go home, think about it. We need to do this for everyone to be in this together. All your family has done it. More, more than likely, most of the time, a lot of the families have already done it, but there's one or two hold offs. I'm like, just think of your family. Uh, they have done it as well, but it might be a good idea for you to do it too. So just always being available for more information, just call me, just talk, talk to me about it. And we've had a very good success rate just because of, of just being open. We're not forcing anything on anyone and we're just, you know, we're pushing it, but not forcing. We have 40% right now in the five county area in public health solutions that have gotten the vaccine. So that's, uh, that's a, quite a high percentage for a rural area. So I think just it's working. Can I add to that? 20 seconds. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I would also like to say that um, in Omaha, a lot of the physicians, particularly the physicians of color, are using motivational interviewing as an option as well to help people come to their own conclusions and make their own decision about whether they get vaccinated and possibly linking that to a loved one or a goal or of something in their life that they can link that to as an opportunity to also help them change their mind and get vaccinated. This has been a really good dis dis discussion, and I hope it's helped the audience here, and I hope it's helped the audience at home. I want to thank each and every one of you for being with us today. Dr. Bob Rahner, the president of Partnership for a Healthy Lincoln. Uh, Dr. Kiana King from the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Center for Reducing Health Disparities. Uh, also, Dr. Jose Gutierrez, from a family physician from Saline Medical Specialties. And also, uh, we have Dr. Afua Nen Entem Mensa, infectious disease physician from Faith Regional Health Services in Norfolk. Thank you all for being with us and for hopefully sh shedding a little bit of light as we uh, look to the, the science and the facts of vaccinations. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. This discussion and the rest of our program are available on our website. You can just go to netnebraska.org slash speakingofnebraska. You can join the conversation on social media as well. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska. And that is going to bring to a conclusion tonight's discussion on vaccine hesit hesitancy here on Speaking of Nebraska. Special thanks to everybody here at Lincoln High. They've gone out of their way uh, to make us feel at home here in the Sorensen Theater. Also want to thank uh, our NET crew and all of those behind the scenes who have made tonight's broadcast possible. Thanks to our audience with us here and thanks to you at home as well watching and listening. It's been great to spend some time with you tonight. We want to remind you that we'll be back in several months with more episodes of Speaking in Nebraska. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Good night. Support for this program has been provided in part by Partnership for a Healthy Lincoln and the Centers for Disease Control.